Hi, this is Marty Kine. I'm a SVP of Strategy at Salesforce Marketing Cloud, and today I'm going to represent a, a webinar that I shared at the Ad Exchanger Innovation Labs a couple weeks back. The title was Future Shock, Planning for an Aggregate and API-Led Future, and it's about basically the future of browser-based advertising. Um, I do make a few, I don't talk about Salesforce much in this presentation, but I do make a few statements about products. Make sure when you purchase our products, our wonderful products, that you do so based on what's already available. I do want to thank you for joining me today. Um, I'll probably take 20, 25 minutes. There's a lot to cover. Uh, we'll do it rapidly. And if you'd like any of this content, if you'd like the um, presentation, just send me a, uh, an email at mkihn at salesforce.com. Or you can uh, hit me up at Twitter at Marty Kin, M-A-R-T-Y-K-I-H-N. So we're going to talk about what's going on, uh, the evolution. So I was, I'm a student of ad tech, mark tech history. So I want to say, how did we get here? And then where are we going in the future? So uh, I do want to stress, though, that there is a drama going on. And this is a drama that's happening in plain sight that most of us don't even see. There are two players in this drama. On the one hand, there is the advertising type, the creatives, the, um, the intelligent analytics people that we all know and love, the account execs, and uh, even the, the marketers and advertisers who are within the, the walls, great companies, great brands. And they are trying to deliver personalized advertising. On the other side, there are what we might call the browser privacy engineers. And they are also advocating for the consumer. They also have a valid point of view around maintaining user privacy. And over the past, say, 15, 16 years, within various browsers, there has been a, what I call here an epic tale of cat and mouse going on, where the browser privacy engineers clamp down on something and then the advertisers look for an edge. And um, 2004, when Safari was released, which is the browser that was created by the Apple Corporation, Safari was released. It deprecated third-party tracking cookies by default. And when the iPhone and the iPad were released in the, the late aughts, 2008, 2009, they have a browser on their Safari browser, obviously, they don't accept cookies. So uh, there's always been an issue with third-party tracking cookies. It's not new. And then in 2018, ETP, the Mozilla ETP, was introduced. Um, intelligent tracking prevention came out even a little bit earlier, which is Apple's latest iteration of its um, anti-tracking technologies. Then the Brave Privacy First Shield was released in 2018. And of course, in 2020, so earlier this year, as I'm speaking, Google made an announcement on the Chromium blog that the third-party tracking cookie in Google, in Google Chrome, which was the last holdout, has a two-year expiration tab on it. And as we know, in this game of cat and mouse, the cat always wins. That is my cat, Jerry. Very handsome fellow sitting on his throne. Formerly my footrest, by the way. You don't see my feet on the footrest. Why is that? Because the cat always wins. So how did, how did we get here? Um, the inventor, the guy that is credited with inventing the browser cookie, is this fellow here, Lou Montulli. Now, Lou Montulli is from Kansas. He was a... Um, uh, Kansas State engineer, software engineer, involved in some of the early work around browsers, the various competing browser protocols, and then HTML. He was sort of at the very advent in the 90s of that. He went to work at a company called Netscape, which was the first very widely adopted browser. It really was the beginning of the consumer internet. And in 1984, on 1994, he was at Netscape as an engineer, and his um, uh, e-commerce team came to him and said, Lou, we need to be able to persist a shopping cart. Can you help us? So if somebody puts shoes in, in their shopping cart and then they go to another page, we don't want to forget it because the internet has no state. You know, it, it really, every page is, is independent. That's the whole point about um, uh, the way it was constructed. That makes it so efficient. But on the other hand, it's not good for persisting information across uh, basic pages at the time. So he invented this thing called a cookie and it was essentially to create a shopping cart. Over time, What's happened is that behind the scenes, as um, third-party cookies have been dropped by various partners and partners of partners and, and injected into iframes, in order to attach all those different cookies uh, from all these different third parties to one another and point to the same browser, there has to be a, an elaborate system of behind-the-scenes syncing, cookie syncing, uh, pixel syncing, you know, one by one pixels, our pixel matches your pixel. And, you know, you could call it as Lou did at one point, the conspiracy. He's not anti-advertising, Lou Montulli, but uh, he, he, he does admit, and we all admit that it's not an efficient system. 
system. And over time, the advertiser, as browsers have clamped down on third party tracking uh, in various methods, the advertisers have found workarounds. So there's the idea of redirects. Uh, you, you can't do third party cookies, so why don't we, uh, we, the ad tech platform, send you when you click on an ad to one of our sites and then immediately redirect you back to where you were going. So you have, you have visited a first party, so we can set a first party cookie on you. First party cookies are set on the site that you're on, so they're slightly more persistent. Um, that's a workaround, and the redirects have been, you know, um, firmly, <laughs> firmly deprecated by ITP. Link decoration is another example. So why don't we put an ID in the um, URL parameters that are sitting on the top of the browser there? Maybe, maybe create a, a, a sort of proxy cookie in the URL. That was something that Facebook did when you clicked. That's no longer possible in certain browsers. Uh, local storage for a while, people were talking about that. Local storage actually sits in a browser. It's large, so you can put almost 10 megabytes of information for every site you visit. Uh, so it seems ideal in a way. It looks a lot like a first party cookie. But um, of course, Apple, Safari engineers noticed this. And so they said, well, we're going to treat local storage more or less like a first party cookie. And then more recently, the idea of email as a new uh, first party ID. So why don't we just use the hash email as our proxy ID for everything? Well, Mozilla now has this add on that they've been testing where even the email that somebody enters into the browser when they're signing up for a form or buying something or logging in can be obfuscated. It can be obfuscated. So the browsers have a lot of power to basically get around any get any workaround that advertisers have come up with. Uh, and I think, as I was saying before, this game of cat and mouse, it, it really has to stop. And we are at a point in the evolution of ad tech and the browsers when I think uh, there is an, enough agreement and a, enough momentum that uh, uh, the future will be worked out. One way or the other, we are at a turning point. So there are six working assumptions for the future. Um, back to life. All my, <laughs> all my song references here are going to be from the, uh, the early 90s, which will tell you uh, the, the era when I was a young man. So six working assumptions. Number one, of course, everybody, I'm assuming within earshot, supports fraud prevention. There's nobody here who wants to let the bad guys win. Uh, that will take that as a given. No user household level ID across domains, including, including maids and IP addresses. What I mean here is that um, it looks unlikely that some user level ID will persist somehow in, in browsers similar to a cookie. Uh, and even on mobile devices. So today mobile apps don't, they, they use um, M M made mobile ad ID. Uh, and there are different forms for the different different types of apps, different operating systems. But those will probably um, go away at some point. And then IP addresses are also at the household level and ID. Um, those probably won't be workable. But there are already issues around that as well. So let's take that as a given. Uh, third, first party state will be maintained somehow. So first party state, what do I mean? If somebody arrives on your site, logs in, maybe they don't log in. In that session, there's got to be some state maintained or else the inter internet is going to break. So that's a nuance. It's more than a nuance. AI, ML, wherever possible. So uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning has got to be enabled uh, everywhere. Everyone agrees with that. So where that can be used and uh, it will be supported. And we'll get into what that means. No government-led solution in the U.S. I just I'm sort of a little bit cynical about the ability to govern, of government to legislate in in the country that I live in in New York, in in the U.S. outside New York. Maybe on a state-by-state -state basis, it's possible. We can't look for the governments to solve this for us. And then the browser privacy teams right now have the upper hand. I think advertising is on defensive. The future is now, though. The discussions are active. They're very active. There's the privacy sandbox, and I put some URLs, links here if you'd like to explore more, as well as contacts for some of the main players if you'd like to follow them on Twitter and so on. Um, privacy sandbox is where the, it's Google Chrome or Chromium is, is Google's sort of browser oversight uh, org. It's an org, a .org. But that is where the proposals for what happens after the cookie are being suggested as explainers and then discussed. And they're mainly being discussed in the World Wide Web Consortia, W3C, um, particular the Web Incubator Community Group, which is, um, I guess we would call it the advanced place. And then the improving web advertising business group, which is where more of the advertiser, the business groups um, congregate. And then, and also privacy community interest group. And um, uh, the, there's a two different groups, privacy community group, privacy interest, interest group. And they meet regularly, these people, and they kind of 
um, bat around these ideas and privacy sandbox and, and other ideas as well. And then there's also Project REARC, which is um, being hosted and sponsored by the IAB, the Internet Advertising Bureau. And that is, uh, that's a year-long project that has four different phases and that is being overseen by um, uh, Jordan Mitchell from Digitrust. So the essence of drama, <laughs> if you attend uh, or even just read the minutes for some of these meetings that are going on now, the W3C, you can see that really the future is being made. And uh, in some ways, it's very revealing. There is a, an enormous amount of drama going on behind the scenes as engineers from different teams argue with one another. And even within the same company, there's not, you cannot assume that, for instance, because two people work at Google, that they're aligned on everything. Why would we assume that? Well, they're not. Uh, there's, there are different parts of Google, uh, just as there are different parts of Apple. And I have here just a quote where they're arguing about the number of bits of entropy that can be allowed in a certain user identity. So the, the real question here, um, the, the essence of what they're getting at, the, these two engineers when they're arguing how many bits of entropy can be allowed, is I'm trying to summarize it here on this chart. And this is the real debate, I think, which isn't explicit yet. This isn't, it isn't really being talked about in these terms, but I'll put it this way to simplify. So we have um, the creatives, the advertising team, and I'll put myself on them, that group. And those are people like myself who feel we're advocating for consumers and we feel that consumers want more relevant ads. We don't want intrusive ads. We don't want our privacy to be breached. We don't want to be intruded upon, spied upon, of course not. But we do want ads that you know might be interesting to us and things that we might want to buy. We don't want irrelevant ads. So that's one thing, consumer advocacy by the, by the ad group. And what do we want? Well, on the x-axis there, we have entropy. How much information about an individual is available? What we would like is as much information as possible. As much as anyone is willing to give us, we will use it in a trustworthy way to personalize advertising. On the other hand, there are the browser engineers. The browser engineers, I would say, and I'm, you know, caricaturing at this point, but I would say what they would like is basically no information allowed out about a person. And they also, poignantly enough, believe that they're advocating for the consumer. They believe that what the consumer wants is no, um, no personal data, like zero entropy. So what that means is no personal data uh, allowed out of their browser ever. And so there's gotta be somewhere in the middle uh, we can't both be completely right or completely wrong. And what, where is that point? Where is the point where the consumer is, their privacy is being respected, but they're also getting some relevant advertising and a certain amount of data is being shared. Where is that point? We don't know yet. We don't. That's what's being worked out. So what do advertisers want? Let's ask this question. <laughs> I like the way the IAB defines this. We basically want two things. We want addressability, which is the ability to target people, and then accountability, the ability to measure. And addressability breaks down into a bunch of different things. Ideally, we would have real-time intent. Real-time intent is what you get in a search engine. So if I go to a search engine, you can pick one or two, and I go and I say car insurance, it's, you know, pretty good idea that sometime around when I'm putting that in, I'm really interested in car insurance. That's real-time intent, and that's, that's amazingly valuable information. Uh, if I can't get that, I'll look at behaviors. If somebody's sort of researching cars, I'll be like, well, maybe they're sort of interested in cars right now. That's a behavior. Attitudes, if I can't get behaviors, I'll look at attitudes. Um, what kind of a person are they? Are they eco-friendly? So maybe they'll be interested in this type of product. And then if I can't get that, I'll look at the context, and the context is maybe... Um, for instance, this is a person who reads about um, you know, uh, saving the planet a lot, so I can put them in a, in a broad group of eco-friendly consumers, something like that. So addressability has different flavors, but it, it does point us to things like lookalikes, uh, retargeting, segmentation, contextual targeting, and then accountability can either be click or view based. This is measurement. And then capping and exclusion, I wanna be able to you know, not show people too much stuff, I wanna be able to have good reach. How do we ensure these things? How do we ensure for the advertising community in a privacy safe way they get both addressability, the ability to target, and accountability, the ability to measure? So if I had to summarize the future and the key terms and all and the debate that's going on now, among the mostly among engineers, to be honest with you, but uh, expanding more to advertisers, it would be in this phrase, aggregate differential privacy APIs. 
Now this is usually when I lose the audience, so, but it is the most important part, so stick with me. So what do I mean by this? Aggregate, differential privacy, and APIs. I break it down into three parts. Aggregate, this is a quote from Michael Kleber up here from Google. He's one of the, uh, one of the main sort of privacy privacy parties in this debate. Adapting to aggregate reporting will require a big change from the ad industry, no two ways about it. Um, what it means is the end of multi-touch attribution. Multi-touch attribution requires user level data. It's building an elaborate model about what did and did not contribute to a desired outcome, such as a purchase at the user level. If you don't have user level data, you've got to change just about everything. Some big changes when we're shifting to aggregate data. And what I mean is you never see any information about a person or a browser. It's always about a group of people. What does that mean? You have to trust the people who are collecting it. It's probably not going to be in real time because if you have only a couple data points, it can't be shared. You need a, at least some um, critical mass, maybe a thousand. Micro targets, so smaller targets, fewer individual will be less available. You're not gonna be able to have tiny little segments anymore. Um, AI and ML models are harder to, to build. They have to be constructed in a different way because you don't have raw data. And then of course, if you do have raw data, you're probably a walled garden or a large publisher. So that's aggregate. Differential privacy, this is, uh, <laughs> this is something that's actually not, that hard to understand, but it's very hard to sort of work with and implement. The idea behind differential privacy, and it did not come from advertising, it was sort of imported into advertising, is that you want to make raw data available to an end user, some, some form of raw data, but it can't, be, uh, it can't be in a form that any individual, an individual person or any individual record, so it could be a person, it could be a, a business, it could be whatever, whatever you're trying to protect, that any individual is, is recognizable. So you can't learn anything about any individual row in this data set. Now, how is that possible? Well, the example it's most often given is um, a U.S. census. So every year, this year included, you, the U.S. government collects census data. So they have a, a record of every household, ideally. And so they want to be able to share this data in its raw form with social scientists so that they can you know, draw conclusions and do analyses. But they can't share the raw data because that would be potentially identifying a lot of different households and revealing things that people don't want revealed. So what they do is use a differential privacy technique where they introduce inaccuracy into the data purposely in a way that's uh, uh, predictably inaccurate. So it, it errs on the left and the right in equal, if I could sort of generalize, in, in an equal um, uh, way, so that then the raw data can be analyzed by the person who's analyzing it, can be provided to them, inaccurate, analyzed, uh, and when they, when they apply aggregate statistics to this raw data, it will be accurate, because the inaccuracy was entered in a, in a way that was known. So in other words, the, the bias is known, but the individual data points are or are not accurate and you don't know. So basically differential privacy is a way of maintaining and you can, you can prove that you're actually maintaining the, the inability to um, intrude upon the privacy of any individual record and yet still provide some sort of data to the end user. So that's differential privacy and it can be applied in the, in the context of, um, as we're going to see browsers for programmatic advertising. And then APIs, APIs, uh, everyone knows what they are, but it's basically the way that, that different applications on the internet can share data. And um, what, what do APIs provide? Well, they, they basically mean you're not, you're not sharing files of data. You're not sending back um, comma, comma separated value files. You're not doing server to server file transfers, but with an API, it's um, setting a permission. It's giving people tokens and it's determining, the API is determining what data can be shared. So a request is made and then it's sent back through the API. So it's, very, it's a very controlled world. Um, you, you need permission to access the API and you're being told exactly what you can and cannot share. More recently, in the last um, month or so, Google has announced uh, certain uh, experiments. And I, I wrote about this in Ad Exchanger earlier this week. But essentially, the experiments were, were four of the proposals in the sandbox were now kind of being moved to the next level. And these are, they're still proposals. They're just trying to sort of validate uh, how they might work in the, in the wild, uh, in particular in real-time bidding context. 
Uh, the two I want to talk about are, are federated learning of cohorts, Flock, and then Turtle Dove, which is a, a retargeting method. Uh, the other two that they proposed were, were privacy budget, and then the Trust Token API, which are re less relevant for ad targeting. Um, and then Sparrow was something that that Critio released. Uh, it's it's still being sort of worked out and discussed. It's not being tested. So federated learning of cohorts is very interesting, and this is the one that's probably talked about the most. So essentially, what happens with a flock is that users are grouped into to cohorts. That's the C, and uh, it's called a flock just for short. So the flock is the cohort using machine learning, and it's based on the behaviors in the browser, and all those behaviors, all the user level behaviors, so whatever I do in my browser, my Chrome browser will say, uh, is stored in the browser. It stays there, it doesn't leave. And then my browser's sort of watching me and it'll, it'll make observations about patterns of behavior. And these patterns are shared with a, with a trusted brain. This is a trusted server somewhere owned by we don't know who, but someone. And that, that trusted server will have the master model. So it will have the, the kind of, you know, Uber view of the internet. It will be able to determine different clusters of types of people based on their behavior. And it will take data from the individual browsers and it will you know, inform the individual browser model. So that's where the federated part comes. They're like little mini models being made in browsers and then this master model. And so what, what the output of all this is, is that each of us will be put into a flock. Each of us, like me, I will be in a flock. And the flock has no name. It's not like I'm in the flock of big spenders, which I probably would not be in, but you know, theoretically. Uh, it would just, I would be in B53, I'd be in some flock and we'd all be in one. And so how can they be used? Well, it would be semi-open. So it's the, the, um, the mechanism isn't exactly determined yet, but it would be a semi-open designator, so B53. And when I went to a website, they would have visibility into my flock. They wouldn't know me. They wouldn't be able to recognize me when I came back. But they would know that a certain number of B53s come to their site. They could go into Google Analytics and see what those people do. And so they could then start to identify which flocks they wanted to advertise to and not. So you can see how they're, they're basically getting labels for segments that may or may not be useful for advertising. Some of the, the challenges that we're going to have to solve if this is going to work is there's a, a lot of uh, issue around what flock am I in? Um, how, how can I, pr me, make sure that that flock doesn't really, uh, um, can't be turned into and doesn't constitute some some of private information, something I don't want known. And there are some ways that that, that could be a danger. The um, the sensitive data category, the sensitive um, segment category is, is a real live issue. And it's mentioned even in the explainer that the engineer wrote. And he said, well, I know, what is a sensitive category? There's, there's no real, other, outside of categories like, um, like HIPAA compliance or um, selling to minors, uh, that there aren't really hard and fast definitions of what's sensitive. And, and actually, what is a consumer considered to be sensitive? For instance, say I'm, I'm really cheap, like I never pay retail, so I'm a bargain basement shopper. I might not want that known. I might consider that that's, um, I don't know, maybe shameful. Even if it's not shameful, it might be the kind of data that I really don't want anyone to know. Is that sensitive? Is that not sensitive? Could you legislate it? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. What if I just don't like cats? I love cats, of course, as you know, but say I don't. Uh, do I want that known? I don't know. So, and then who owns this master model? Good question. Turtle Dove is, is the other one uh, that's being tested. And this one is, is more complicated. It's harder to explain. Uh, and it's, it's really quite clever if you stop and think about it. So essentially what it does is it separates the interest group and the context. And what do I mean by that? Well, the context is um, the site where the, where the user is and where the ad is going to appear. That's the context. The interest group, on the other hand, is um, something about that person, or we'll say the browser, that uh, would be of interest to a particular advertiser. So for example, think about this as, as a replacement for retargeting. So for example, I go to a retailer and I start looking at a particular pair of running shoes. So I can then be put in an interest group, which is person interested in running shoes from brand X. So that's my interest group. And then the browser 
the browser itself will store my interest group. It's not stored anywhere else. It's in the browser along with, so it's the label, guy interested in running shoes, along with the bids that that um, uh, advertiser might be willing to, to pay for someone like me, bidding logic. So um, they, they can actually, this hasn't been defined, but you can put in some kind of logic in there. Uh, if it's, you know, after midnight, bid less, something like that. And then the ads, the actual ad units. So everything that you need to execute an ad for this particular interest group is put in the browser and stored. It's a lot of storage in the browser, but you get my point. And then later on, so that's just in there. And then the person goes on their merry way. And later on, they'll arrive on a site or, or um, their publisher or an ad network will make an opportunity available. That's called a context. And so it's totally different from the interest group. So then the, the context will appear, the, um, the URL and some other signals will be sent to the browser. So the browser now has, he's in this interest group and there is an ad opportunity. The browser, the browser will run an auction. It will look at what the bids were for me, the interest group. It will look at what the, what the bids are um, for this context, you know, this site, this, this type of ad unit time of day, whatever, and it will run an auction and it will determine who wins. And if the interest group ads wins, then it will just be served right by the, by the um, browser. So basically the publisher doesn't know the interest group and the interest group brand doesn't know the context the publisher. So you can't really, I mean, ideally you wouldn't really know much about the person at all. There's all kinds of challenges here. <laughs> other than complexity. Number one, there's a time lag. So the interest groups, you can't update them. Um, there's gotta be a lag between when the interest group is identified and the context. If it's identically, if it's in that moment, then um, you, can, you can tie them together using a timestamp or something. So there's gotta be a time lag. And so that means that the interest groups are gathered in a certain cadence that's slower than immediately. So uh, the, the real timeness of retargeting will be impacted. So that's one thing. And also things like um, setting budgets, you know, doing frequency capping, ad relevance. Separating interest group and context makes brand safety difficult to enforce. So for instance, I may be in the running shoe category and then um, I appear, uh, the context appears, so I'm on a site and there's some kind of, I'm just making this up, article about how running is very dangerous or it's bad for you or something. But I, I, if you separate context from interest group, you would never be able to put those two things together. In other words, you would never know that this interest group is about to appear in this context because those are supposed to be separate domains. Um, how can you enforce brand safety in that context? Well, there's some um, proposals around in the context information sharing signals. Um, what those signals are is, is difficult to know. Then complex auctions, custom logic more difficult, that goes without saying. If you wanna have many different rules in your, in your auction, um, how, do you, how do you load all that up ahead of time into a browser? And then how do you prevent websites from, that is the context from seeing the ads that they're showing because then they'd be able to tell the interest group. So uh, how, how do you make them opaque? And this, this idea is around opaque iframes. Um, but again, to be determined. Um, Still very interesting and we'll see how it tests out. Now conversion tracking has elicited the most interest and the most proposals around this. This is critical. I mean, conversion tracking is absolutely essential. If you think about the way Facebook, you can do um, um, C, uh, CPA, so cost per acquisition, you can do cost per download if it's a mobile app. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of economics that are tied into the idea of being able to measure a click and an outcome and being able to tie them together. It is possible today. Uh, how can we pre preserve that? Even Apple has weighed in with privacy pre preserving ad click attribution. So Apple, because they have a, a large app ecosystem, I think, uh, does, wanna, does wanna preserve some sort of measurement, click through measurement. Google, on the other hand, has event level conversion measurement proposal and then a click through conversion measurement. And then there's uh, another proposal around an aggregation service and conversion measurement with aggregation. And then Facebook has one around private lift measurement. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about here is privacy preserving ad click attribution. And there are a couple of different proposals, as I said, this is Apple's one. And basically how this work, it has the same general shape. And I think the theme that I would like you to take away from this is that the browsers maintain all the user level data. That stays there. And that what is, what is sent out of the browser is some, some kind of aggregate reporting. And in the case of this privacy preserving one, there's an, a, a new tag is being proposed that you add in the A, so the click um, HTML code. And it adds new metadata, 
which would be a destination ID. This is provided by the advertiser and a campaign ID. So it's basically where are you sending them when the person clicks, where are you sending them? Destination ID, then a campaign ID, some sort of uh, information around what ads you're showing, what campaign is part of. Then the advertiser sends this event by, by, by a pixel to a well-known URL. So essentially, when the event happens, somebody clicks on an ad and then they go to a page and they do the thing that you want them to do. They buy, it's a thank you page, or they, um, I don't know, visit a certain section, sign up for a newsletter. Then you can use a, a pixel that then goes, um, shares that, conversion event, that success event, with a well-known URL. So there's a trusted server again. And then that trusted server will ask the browser to, to get the ad data from storage, and then at some point in the future, a report is sent to the advertiser. So basically, the, the, the tie between the, the success event and the impression is made in the browser. And then once there's a certain number of people who's, who have done this thing, who've completed the loop, then an aggregate report later on, so that you can't do any time stamping thing here, is sent to the advertiser. So the advertiser will get a report saying, you know, 100 people who clicked on your ad ended up buying this product with some campaign information. So it's, it's useful. Uh, but you can see there are a lot of hops there. There's another one around aggregate reporting API, which is less about click attribution. And this is more about reach. So you're trying to figure out how many people saw your ad and um, you know, saw it in a valid context. And it's proposing another, you can see the steps here, a new JavaScript layer, uh, a write only per origin data store. So basically, it's, it's kind of like a data store in the browser um, that can't be overwritten. It's, it's, it's write only, it can be accessed by third party iframes where allowed. So you have to worry about ad networks and you have to worry about people who are not the site itself serving ads. So if you wanna preserve any of ad tech, it has to allow third, some third party access to the site. And the user visits the domain with the ad, campaign data, domain, and other slides, whatever, like maybe the country that they're in, are stored in the browser. So all the information around the impression is stored in the browser. And then there, there is a trusted server again who will be able to, through some mechanism to be determined, figure out if, if a certain aggregate threshold of, of different browsers have reached whatever the state is, then they can send a report. So if one person sees an ad, you won't get a report. But if it's over 100 or 1,000 or whatever, you will receive a report. And it will say, um, it will say how many people and, and uh, where they have a scene. So that's aggregate reporting. But it is aggregate. So you're not, you don't know who saw what where anymore. There's no sort of kind of cookieing going on. Um, but you do know a certain, it'll, it'll tell you something about the reach and something about where the ad appeared. The, the challenges with ad attribution, there are a number of them. On the click-based side, well, it only measures clicks, so it does not view through attribution. So you don't know the impact of an ad that somebody saw on a later conversion event, only if somebody clicks. So we're almost going back to last click measurement. <laughs> conversion events and related information are really, um, are really limited. That's when they were arguing earlier about bits. You know, Google wants 64 bits, Apple wants 8 bit. There's a, there's a big difference. Uh, 8 bits, you can't store a lot of data, but that would be all the information that you can get about what the ad was, um, anything you wanted about the price, the SKU. So if you're trying to get reporting around um, people clicked on this ad and then they bought, you know, this particular shoe, this color, this assortment, at this, you're not going to get that level of data. It'll be more blunt, depending on who wins out. Number of campaigns are limited, so 64 total campaigns. So you're not gonna be able to use the campaign ID, for instance, as a proxy for people, or even as a, a proxy for the different versions, ad versions, uh, if you're a typical advertiser. And then there's no real, as far as I can see, auditing. Um, you really have to trust the browser and the well-known URL, the mechanism behind it all. And then uh, aggregate, well, you know, third-party access to browser storage, is a big question. So how do you allow ad tech, how do you allow any kind of ad server from outside to um, be able to access that, that browser when that's a third party? And then frequency capping, algorithmic attribution. All, there, there are feints toward this. They're like, uh, what about frequency capping? How do we enable it? And the suggestions right now are, are really rough. It's sort of hard to see how they're gonna work. So there's a lot to be determined there as well. But I think we can draw some reasonable conclusions here, I'll say. So the power has really shifted. I think for a while, advertisers were, it was a little bit like the Wild West. Advertisers were um, abusing their power in many cases. There were a lot of fraudsters, a lot of good advertising too, uh, we'll say. But um, 
right now that I think the shift is the other way as things do the pendulum has shifted back and now that it's you know the browsers who are in charge the operating systems they have the upper hand and and the governments who are enacting legislation advertising is on defense and it, it really hasn't come up with um, a real case for the consumer value of relevant advertising why is it good for the economy why is it good for people why is it good for creativity there's a lot of good um, a lot of good that comes out from good advertising. And I think a lot of good that consumers will see and do value. I think they like good ad experiences. I think consumers find advertising funny sometimes. Um, but that case hasn't, hasn't been made, although it's implicit. Uh, I don't think there'll be a new cookie. I, I really don't think there'll be a new ID. Um, I, that's this sort of like a live argument about that, but um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, th I think the, the kind of any kind of user level tracking outside of a first party domain or even within a walled garden, where somebody is quite literally logging in, uh, anything outside of that, like cross domains or cross gardens, even, is going to be a very hard sell in the current environment. And then, what is this brain server? Who is this trusted server? You, you hear me say that a lot. That's a big question. I don't think, you know, people in ad tech are worried about this. People outside of it aren't even thinking about it. It's implied in these proposals that it will be Google. And I think Google believes you can trust Google. And uh, I have no reason to think you can't trust Google. They're a trusted partner of ours at Salesforce. Um, but it should be asked this question, is this trusted server uh, something that we can all agree on? Should it be an independent third party? I don't, necessarily mean the IAB, but um, yeah, could it be, um, or the, is it the IAB? I, I don't know. But uh, you know, who, owns, who owns this master model? Because that, that, there's a lot of sort of implicit um, authority, but also implicit risk and burden placed on the owner of this, of this um, trusted server. And then the AI ML models, you know, raw data is always better for AI and ML. The, be the more raw data, the better. And whoever has the raw data will have more accurate models. So that's worth keeping in mind. And the final point I'll make is around the Civil War. Um, so we have, I haven't mentioned this, it's sort of in the background, but there has of course been a pandemic going on, global pandemic, uh, recession. So we're in very difficult times right now. And so all of this advertising chatter can seem uh, almost trivial. I think it, I mean, it is important in the long run and uh, it's, it's a very important industry and we all have a stake in it. Um, keeping it in perspective, obviously, there are bigger problems in the world. But I think that it's times like this when we have a lot of crises going on, crises in, in browser IDs, of course, but also crises in society, when uh, people can and have in the past come together more. We're all in the same boat. So there's a lot more sharing, a lot, of op a lot more openness. And this picture here is uh, the Civil War before the Civil War, um, in, in the US, there were different rail gauge standards. So basically anyone could set up their own railroad, and there were a lot of them. And uh, there was no standard for how wide apart these rails were. So the, the, railroad, the different railroads were essentially incompatible. They couldn't work together. And so it was realized, you know, we had this, this terrible war, and then a horrible recession, and then another one. And it was realized that we actually, this is hurting everyone the fact that we don't have a rail gate standard. We can't do um, transcontinental commerce. We can't do trans-state commerce. So it's just getting in the way of everyone's sort of, uh, not only welfare, but the, the strength of the economy. So they got together and they agreed to a rail standard. You say, big deal. Well, it actually opened up uh, transcontinental commerce, freight, and it caused uh, the, the boom that happened in the 70s. So, so I think that uh, it is times like now when, when people can come together, when they can do some good constructive give and take, and some compromise can be reached. And so uh, I guess I'll open up for questions, although it's not live, so I can't have questions. But if you do have any questions, just ping me in either one of those spots. And uh, thank you again for your time. I hope it's been interesting. I look forward to continuing the discussion.